Good morning again, church family. My name is Davey Gibson. I'm the education and discipleship pastor here at Sugarland Baptist Church. Thank you so much for joining us for our first um, live stream pastor's class of 2021. We truly are a hybrid class today. We have a couple here in the sanctuary that are, wor- that are studying God's word with us in person. And then so many of you have chosen to join with us on our live stream. So thank you for being a part of this first Bible study of 2021. I'm excited for a new year, and I'm excited for Pastor Taylor's new sermon series. I hope you were able to worship with us just a few minutes ago. If you didn't, you'll be able to catch that um, sermon as we post it again to our YouTube channel during the week. We're excited for our new sermon series. We're excited for a new Bible study series. Our new Bible study series is called Pure Joy, A Choice to Rejoice. It's a study of the book of Philippians. And so I would hope that each one of you has an opportunity to have one of our study guides as we go through this study together. If you don't, you can email me up here at the church, dgibson at sugarlandbaptist.org. We will ship one to you, put it in the mail to you. We'll bring it by your house, drop it on the front porch, or you can stop by any time during the week and you can pick up your copy right outside our office. We have a cart there with plenty of books and we would love for you to be able to follow along with us. If you are new to our Bible studies at Sugarland Baptist Church, we have small group Bible studies that meet before and after worship each week. And so if you would like to be a part of a Bible study that's more of a dialogue, while I'm very thankful to have the Yohos with me in the room, I didn't really prepare a dialogue with them because we're just kind of doing a monologue, just sharing God's word in in a one-sided part of the conversation. If you would like to be in a dialogue, we have classes that meet remotely via Zoom or in person in the building, socially distant with their masks, and we can get you plugged into a Bible study to start this new year. Again, just shoot me an email and we'll be happy to take you to a class. For many of us now, Christmas has come to an end. I'm sure it might have been one that felt very, very different as we gathered and or didn't gather due to the pandemic, but I hope that you did as we did, share in some normal celebrations with family and friends as much as you could. And yes, the boys, my boys, Will and Jack, are age 7 and 11. They got plenty of presents. And with the presents the boys received, we always try to instruct them to voice gratitude to whoever gave them the present. Sometimes to no avail, but we always encourage them before the present is open, make sure you find out who gave that to you and go and say thank you. For adults, this is often that time of year where we get out our thank you cards or our note cards and start to write a few thank you notes. I know there have been several of you who have remembered our church staff during the holidays and dropped off small gifts and especially cards that show pictures of your families. Some of you have completely new hairdos that I have not seen in nine months. And so I'm really thankful for some of those cards that came in the mail because it allowed me to know what you're going to look like when you walk back in our building this year. Well, one of the reasons Paul penned this most beloved letter that we call Philippians to the church at Philippi was a genuine, heartfelt thank you. This is Paul's thank you letter. And as we launch into this new study today, we're going to be journeying through Philippians for three months. It will carry us through our journey through Lent right up until Easter. I pray that the Holy Spirit will use this wonderful letter to speak to us as we start this new year together. We're going to start with the very first part of Philippians, Philippians 1, verses 1 to 11. It's the the intro to the book, if you will. So grab your study guide. It's lesson one. Grab your Bible or open your app, and let's find Philippians 1, 1 to 11. And as you're doing that, I wanted to give us a brief background on this most important church in the ancient world. And church is a very important thing to note that Paul is writing not just to individuals, although he will call out a few individuals in Philippians, but this is a letter written to a church. He has some letters he writes to individuals like Timothy or Philemon, but this is written to a group of people, the church. And I've heard it said, and I've said it many times, that you can be a Christian and not go to church, but you just can't be a good one. To live the life that God has called us to in Christ Jesus, we need the fellowship of other believers. We need the church. And that doesn't mean the church has to look like this with pews and a steeple that meets at 945 every week. Although I'm very thankful for my church that worships each week at 945, either in person or online. But it does mean that a community of like-minded Christ followers, this is the plan that God has set out from the beginning of time into the new covenant that he made with his people. Paul understands this very well as better than anyone. 
and he loves all the churches that he helped plant and feels a connection, a deep connection to each and every one of them. And so this theme for his letter is thankfulness and joy. An overflowing of thankfulness and joy over the believers in Philippi. And you'll see that in each and every lesson as we march through this short book together. So as we think back to this time period as Paul was writing, scholars debate about exactly where and when the letter was written, but no one really questions that Paul is the one writing it and the church in Philippi is the intended audience. Most scholars believe that Paul was imprisoned in Rome towards the end of his life around 62 AD when he wrote the letter to Philippians. Acts documents that Paul's final imprisonment was in Rome and lasted over two years, so sometime in that time period. There are others that might feel that, his, that he was imprisoned in Ephesus around 53 AD, so about 10 years prior, and that is where he is. And then there's some that think he could have been in Colossae. We, we understand that Paul is imprisoned, and he mentions in the New Testament mentions that Paul is imprisoned many times, and he even mentions it in 2 Corinthians 11. But nevertheless, Paul mentions in verse 13 of, of Philippians 1, he talks about the praetorium, a literal military headquarters that is where he is being imprisoned. And this would mean the emperor's personal bodyguards or a staff that worked for the governor's office, like in Ephesus. And I feel like Paul was probably in Rome under palace guard. The praetorians would have consisted of 12 groups of 1,000 soldiers each. This is a major military installation. They are extremely feared and extremely powerful. And their entire job is to keep the emperor safe and to make sure that the Roman Senate doesn't get too much power. With either possibility, the point here is that Paul is in a place of great worldly power and great Roman control, and yet the gospel is still going out. The gospel is still going out even to the most elite places in the Roman Empire. Well, Philippi was a city that had a great history. It was conquered originally by Philip II of Macedon around the 4th century B.C., so before Jesus, and it became a Roman colony when Mark Anthony and Octavian defeat Brutus and Cassius in 42 B.C. at the end of that great Roman Civil War. From that moment on, it was the place where the Roman soldiers got put out to pasture. It was the Roman soldier Del Webb Sweetgrass. It was the retirement community for the Felix Legions. These are where the, loyal emperor, the, the emperor's loyal soldiers would be able to retire after a long time of service. So it's a retirement home of sorts. Thus, there is a big support of the emperor. And the emperor during the Roman times wasn't just more of a president or king or leader. This was a person who was celebrated with divine, as a divine being, a godlike figure. The emperor cult, worshiping Caesar as God, would have been one of the major religions in Philippi especially and around the Roman world. So Paul arrives in this area from being in modern-day Turkey. And if you have time this week, I encourage you to go back and look at Acts 16. Acts 16 talks about Paul's second missionary journey. It's come up on the screen right here, and you can see where Paul left there in Asia Minor and modern-day Turkey and then took a boat across the top part of the Aegean Sea there. And he lands near uh, Philippi, and he immediately discovers that there's no Jewish synagogue, but he finds women praying outside the town, and that's where he meets Lydia and her family. Acts 16 records all this. And so that's where Lydia and her household are saved and a primary Gentile church is formed. And right now you can still see where we suppose Lydia was baptized. There's a baptistry of Lydia where believers can still be baptized to this day outside the ancient city of Philippi. From the outset of the church's founding, Philippian Christians hold a special place in Paul's heart and vice versa. For the church in Philippi is the very first church founded in Europe. So if we trace our spiritual heritage back to the churches in Europe and the Great Reformation, this is going back even further to the very first time the gospel comes to Europe. Well, the, the, the town of Philippi is a very important town. It has great significance for Paul. They send him consistent support, both prayer support and financial support, and they often will send him visitors as we see. Philippi is located on a major roadway called the Via Ignatia. It was the main road, the main highway that connected Istanbul all the way over to the 
port that would take you to Rome. So it connected Constantinople, Istanbul, the major city of the east with the major city of the west, Rome. It would have been a, about a two months long journey, but it wouldn't have been an impossible journey. And so the city itself, you can still see remnants of this road and see what a major highway it was. I mean, look at that picture. This is thousands and thousands of years old, yet the stones that the Romans walked on are still visible today in ancient Philippi. And so the city itself would have been well over 25% Roman. And Latin, as we can see from ruins, was the official language of the town. A strong Roman influence here. But because of the large Roman population and influence, a lot of scholars believe it wasn't likely the first convert to Christianity would have been for this, from this large Roman population, but probably more of the indigenous people, the craftsmen, the shopkeepers, the farmers, the slaves, among with some of the Jews and God-fearing Gentiles that were there. As one commentator I read this week noted, a third of the church would have probably been Roman citizens taken from service groups and freed slaves who gained citizenship upon their um, emancipation, but they also would have been quite poor. And so when Paul talks about being grateful for the financial gifts that the Philippians have sent him, they are maybe not even giving out of their wealth, but maybe even out of their poverty, that they are giving because they feel so connected to Paul. Still, the town was very wealthy. There were neighboring mountains with gold and silver mines that were constantly being mined and brought down to Philippi, where the mints of Philippi would create them into coinage for the region to help promote trade and commerce. Paul understood the importance of this area. He understood the importance of a church and this pivotal area in the Roman world. And it's the first church that's in Macedonia, and it's a very special place in Paul's heart. So let's jump in now to Philippians 1 and see what Paul has to say as he seeks to encourage, to challenge, and to speak a voice of gratitude and joy to the church at at Philippi. Follow along with me. Philippians 1, 1 begins. Paul, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons, grace and peace to you from God our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I remember you and all my prayers for all of you. I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Because being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It's right for me to feel this way about you since I have you in my heart. Whether I am in chains or defending or confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth and insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Christ Jesus to the glory of God and praise of God. Paul begins this letter in a very typical way for anyone writing in the ancient world. It always starts with the person who was writing the letter. You would get it as kind of like the tag that was put on some of your presents, uh, a, an identification of who gave the gift and who it was for. I made the mistake as I wrapped some of Jordan's gifts this year. I didn't put tags on all of them. I was very proud of myself for getting them all wrapped, but forgot to put the tags on there. So we just kind of had a rule that anything that wasn't labeled, because she does most of the other gift wrapping, was probably for her. And that's how we discovered it. But Paul in the ancient world always starts by saying who is writing. So you don't have to unroll a scroll or get the entire letter unfurled to find out who is writing you. First, the announcement of who it is, the greeting of the audience, and unlike his other letters, Paul doesn't declare his apostleship right out. This letter begins with a much more personal way. It skips over Paul's many credentials altogether. It's almost like he's, this is a letter written between friends. Paul even starts out immediately by calling them partners and, part, and, and partakers of grace together. The modern-day scholar and New Testament um, uh, uh, scholar N.T. Wright calls this partnership something that would go way deeper than what we would say a fellowship is among church. You know, we use the word fellowship a lot in our church. We, and especially in Baptist churches, we have fellowship halls. We talk about events where we gather and visit as being fellowships. Well, this is more than just friends gathering. This would have been a practical or even financial partnership, a connection between 
the Philippians and Paul. N.T. Wright puts it this way, the Philippians then are partners in the gospel, partners in grace. They are in the gospel business with Paul, this grace business. Another commentator noted that Paul, that they are preaching the same gospel as Paul, just like Paul did. And they are praying for Paul and have sent monetary gifts to Paul. They put their money where their mouth was. So we've already noted that Paul was in prison during this time. And prison back then was actually very different from what it is today. Since Paul probably couldn't make money in prison as a tent maker, there wasn't probably a lot of demand for a tent making business in prison. He would then he was also more than likely chained to a guard at all times. And that meant he would have relied on the charity of benefactors. The support of someone who is an enemy of Rome in prison wouldn't have been easy, and it could have been a dangerous thing, but the Philippians were committed to the gospel, and they were committed to the one who preached it to them first, Paul. N.T. Wright continues, the fact that people from a different country would raise money and send one of their own on this dangerous journey to carry this gift to an imprisoned friend speaks volumes of the connection they feel. So Paul greets them as any friends would with peace and with grace. The word peace to a Hebrew, shalom, would have been a standard Jewish greeting, meaning much more than just the absence of conflict, but that a holistic well-being was being wished on one another. Grace, the word charis, It was the Gentile greeting, the Greek greeting. And so Paul uses both Jewish and Gentile, uh, both Jewish and Gentile greetings as he begins his letter. And he's also writing to the saints that are in Christ Jesus in Philippi there in verse 1. Note there's not really a concept in ancient church history about what we would normally think normal Catholic church and and Orthodox churches think when it comes to saints. So these are not individuals that he's writing to, but implying that the entire church is saintly. They are being set apart. They're holy and being set apart for God's purpose. There's no definite article either for the deacons and overseers. So again, we don't think Paul is writing to a specific group of deacons or a specific group of elders or overseers, but assuming Paul's not singling anyone out but that the, in the church, but he's admonishing those who serve the church at that moment in a special capacity along with the entire congregation of saints. And as he was writing on this text, Dr. Fred Craddock, long-term, a long-time minister, connects Paul's writing with just the overall, right, uh, the overall situation when it comes to salvation. When Paul talks about salvation, he never talks about it as just a one-time thing. He talks about being saved, continuing. So we were saved, we are being saved, and one day we will be saved. There's a past, present, and future tense of what God does even with our salvation. And so when Paul talks about the past, he talks about how it's been between the church and Paul, how they were all saved by grace. That happens in verses 3, 4, and 5. And then by 6, he moves into the talk of the present, how it is now between the church and Paul. They are being saved, verses 6, 7, and 8. And then he concludes with a future hope, how it will be for the Philippians until the day of Christ Jesus in verses 9 to 11. Let's unpack this a little bit more. When we look again at verses 3 through 5, we start there with the, I thank God every time I remember you in my prayers. Paul begins with a thanksgiving, remembering for remembering him, and notes how he prays for them. Paul is public with his deep gratitude and his feelings for the Philippian church. As I was continuing to read, uh, one scholar noted that Paul is being thankful to God, but not thankful for everything. They, this author continues, we see that the rest of the letter, in the rest of the letter, that Paul does not say he's thankful for every specific event, uh, thought, or attitude expressed in the world. Rather, he is thankful that nothing in this world can nullify God's grace. So everything will end, everything, so in everything, it will end and serve God's purpose. We can relate to those circumstances in our current predicament, right? We don't have to be thankful for everything, but we are thankful to God that nothing escapes his grace. There's nothing God cannot redeem. There's nothing that catches God by surprise. Paul uses his hardships to point others to God. I took that as a challenge this week. How many times have I used my hardships to just simply give me an excuse to complain or to give me an excuse to show others how God is continuing to work in my life and in their lives? There are lots of places Paul would rather be than where he is as he's writing these words, chained to a Roman guard. And yet Paul remains thankful for God's faithfulness, demonstrated in the acts of love by the Philippian church. 
They are both committed to that partnership. The word is koinonia in Greek, the word where we ultimately get our word fellowship and love from, and they have, that they have shown to Paul. They both have been saved by God's gospel, and they are committed to seeing that that is the gospel that is being preached in Rome, just like it is in Philippi. Well, Paul is also thankful because not only have they been saved, but as he puts it in verse 6, they are continuing to be saved. This is one of the famous verses that we love to memorize and quote in Philippians. Look at verse 6 with me on your screen. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It is God who's done the good work, and it is God who will see it through to completion. Paul says that these feelings are coming deep down, literally from his innards, his bowels. We normally don't think about that as where love comes from, but in the ancient world, all they knew was that was in the deepest part of who they were. That's how Paul felt connected to them. Paul wanted them to know that his feelings came from the deepest part of his being. And this deep love came from Jesus Christ. And he will expound on that as we look at chapter 2 when we talk about having this same mind that is in you that is also in Christ. Fred Craddock continued to note that Paul calls God as a witness on his behalf and characterizes that his love is that of Christ himself. And Paul is not looking to simply flatter himself and say, look, I have love from Christ and as, to, make, to put him above the Philippians. In fact, he wants, he, we note that in the ancient world, orators would have, wanted you to, uh, would have wanted to tell you what you wanted to hear so that they could get something back from you, like food or recommendations or some kind of social advancement. Does that sound familiar like maybe any of the politicians we know today? But in Paul's day, no one would have been so cavalier as to use God's name as a witness if they thought they were lying. The ancient church father, John Christentum, Christentum asks it this way, Now, had he been flattering them, he would not have called God to witness, for this could not be done without peril. And so, as we look at verses 7 and 8, in verse 8, God can testify how I long for all of you from my deep being with the affection of Christ Jesus. Well, then Paul concludes this small part, this introduction of his letter, with the, the... by pointing out that God began his work in the past, is doing work in the present, and he will conclude it in the future on the day of Christ Jesus. Paul prays that the Philippians will grow and mature in love. As Fred Craddock put it, it is joining knowledge and understanding. It's a love that puts itself to the test in real life. Craddock continues noting that Paul prays that the church be pure and blameless. This kind of love is not some... um, love that just comes one day and is gone the next. This is the word agape. It's that same word that Paul uses when he's writing in 1 Corinthians 13, that love chapter. A love that has no room for pride, a love that has no room for keeping score, a love that always forgives. Another author described this love as arranging knowledge so that it reflects God's wisdom and care for creation properly and values life, all life appropriately. We also note that this love is not just an emotional state of being But it stems from God's very being. And God demonstrates this love in the incarnation of Christ. This new love will shift our worldview so that we are no longer the center of our own universe. Rather, God is. I believe this is how Paul can view, how Paul views his life and his situation being in, in, a, in, a, in a prison he can't get out of. And sometimes we might feel like this pandemic is a prison we can't get out of. Yet when we focus not on our own itch, issue, but we continue to focus on God and what he's calling us to, we recognize that God will put this love, this joy, this thankfulness in us. Well, Fred Craddock concludes in his writing on our text this week, noting that it's often in Advent that this verse gets read. And we just finished Advent because it talks about this, ecclesia, this eschatological hope, this end-time hope, this day of Christ Jesus. And so we know that, that Christmas is gone now, but the truth of Christmas is for really every day of the year. It's God has sent his Son. God is working through this body of Christ now, the church. And one day God will bring everything to completion And so in many ways, I think as we start to go through Philippians together, we'll really realize that this is Paul's devotional book. This is what makes Paul tick. These are all the things that Paul, at the end of his life, wants to share with his beloved church. And so I pray we hear the heart of Paul in this study, but I pray it draws us even closer to the heart and mind of Christ that will overflow with joy, just as Paul did 
And he called his friends in Philippi to share in this joy as well. I read uh, this week that one of the greatest temptations for believers is when we start to think about joy and we reduce joy to just momentary happiness. Dr. Andrew Root wrote it this way, happiness is no evil if it comes, and and when it comes, it is welcomed and it's even celebrated, but it's worth noting that no sought-after horizon for a well-lived life of happiness is worth truly aiming for. And he reminds us back to that story about the rich young ruler. And as we conclude, just think about the difference between joy and happiness. We remember the story. The rich young ruler came to Jesus, called him good teacher. Jesus said, what? Why do you call me good? Only God is good. Then pointing out who he truly was. And when it was all over, Jesus gave the rich young ruler an incredible opportunity. He was given the same invitation that all the disciples were given. To come and follow me. Yet the rich young ruler is focused on the things of this world, the momentary goods that he had, the happiness that he thought they would give them, and so he left sad. We need to be reminded by this story that, that the, when, we, when we seek the goodness of God, not the happiness of the goods of this life, joy will be our ultimate outcome. Paul could rejoice the Philippians were living lives worthy of the gospels, worthy of the gospel, and, and weren't and, and that not even the suffering of, that he was experiencing or maybe even the suffering the Philippians were experiencing could take away from their ability to rejoice and their connection with one another through this gospel. This is what, what fueled Paul's life every day and it will fuel ours as well as we seek to choose pure joy, to choose to rejoice as our lesson, as our, the title of our story reminds us, to make joy the priority for 2021. I challenge us this week to look for ways we can be joyful, to look for ways that God is wanting to pour his joy into our lives so that the things of this world, the things that might take our eyes off of him will become strangely dim as the old hymn says in the light of his glory and his grace. As Paul says, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory of God the Father. This is his prayer for the church in Philippi and our prayer for each one of you that we would abound in this love, abound in this joy, abound in this thankfulness as we start 2021. Thank you for joining us this week for our our online Bible study. Thank you for being here. We're going to continue to have these studies. Pastor Jeff will be leading us next week. And then we will continue to meet either in person or online in all of our studies each week. Please join me in prayer and we'll be concluded this morning. God, thank you. Thank you for hearing the prayers of Paul for the church in Philippi. Thank you for, for, for preserving this, this letter from Paul that, that your Holy Spirit uses to speak to us, this divinely inspired book that, that, can, that can point us to how we can truly experience joy even in the midst of times that, that cause us great sadness, cause us great consternation, that cause us great trouble. Yet we know that when we look to you, when we look to you, we will find joy because you are the one that that has that is that that can redeem all things you are the one that continues to work in our lives you are the one that doesn't give up on us it doesn't give up on this year world we thank you that you are working all things for our good good of those who love you and for your ultimate glory so god help us be a people this week that sees that that sees you at work and rejoices just as paul did as he saw the work you were doing in the church at Philippi over the last 10 years and, or 20 years in, the, in his absence, and he rejoiced that they were still proclaiming your gospel and that you were still doing the saving work in that church. God, we pray that for our church, that you do a saving work in all of our lives this year. That you continue to bring people here that need to know who you are and who you've called us all to be that we continue to be a church that goes outside of these walls and proclaims as we live our lives, as we continue to go around our, our area and around our state and around our world, that you are the king, that you are on the throne, and that you are for us, that you are a God who loves, a God full of grace. So God, thank you for this study. May it be fruitful in all of our lives. And God, we ask all this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Friends, I hope you have a blessed week. And we look forward to seeing you next week.